Today, we are really focusing on free BMD and celebrating 20 years of one of the most fantastic transcription projects run by volunteers, achieved through the work of thousands of volunteers that there is still very used today. I would like, therefore, to focus my introduction around what's happening in the other projects of Free UK Genealogy and Free UK Genealogy in general. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was a bit of a lot of what, what the, the support team, myself, Denise, Rich, um, who's over there somewhere, Helen, the digitizer, and Helen, the bookkeeper, do, is actually really boring stuff. So a lot of what we've been focusing on over the last few months is the GDPR legislation, which has taken us a huge amount of time and we're still working on. Like many open data organisations, we are actually passionate about privacy and we are, have been doing an awful lot to make sure that the personal data of our transcribers, our researchers is protected as it should be. But we are also an open data organisation and an open source organisation. And one of the things that we've been working on in this past year is inviting both new transcribers on FreeSend and FreeReg and existing transcribers on those projects to sign a transcription agreement which will allow us to open their data to anybody that wants to use it for whatever purpose. I'm very pleased to say that to date, that about 20% of the records on Free Reg are now open. We haven't quite finished the work at the back end, which will allow us to serve them, but they are servable. And of those 20% those, those of people who've signed the agreement, it's about 30%. No, sorry, I've got the rep wrong. Wrong with statistics in my head, doing them off the top of my head, look at what could be written down, how many get it right. Yes, uh, it's about 12% of the active volunteers, but those are 20% of the records, or that's eight over 8 million records, which is about, just coincidentally, about half the death records, if they were all that death records, because we passed the 15 million death records on free reg just a couple of weeks ago. On free sen it's slightly behind because we're not at uh, the back end of free sen isn't as developed but what we do have is all the census material from Cornwall is now available to be shared. We have a couple of new features on free send and free reg which should be live within the next few weeks. One of which is that the records will have permanent URLs. That is, there will be something that you can copy and put into your notes or into your family tree, which will always link back to that record on free reg. At the moment, or free send, at the moment it won't. You can copy the URL, but it, it, it's a luck of the draw whether you end up on the same server next time. And if you don't, it'll give you a 404 error, but it will be a permanent one. For older records, those URLs will be prettified. By that we mean if they will contain a bit of data as well. So it might say baptism, John Smith, Bradford, 1840, or census 1891, Julia Mackenzie, Colchester, which would be enough for you as a, as a researcher to be able to look at a URL and work out who it is in your family tree, probably you're talking about. That will add in very nicely to another project which has been developed over the summer using a Google Summer of Code intern. This is an intern who is paid for by Google to work on our projects. And this one of the two interns we had has been working on creating citations from FreeSend and FreeReg. We have almost finished the beta testing on that and they should, again should go live in the next couple of weeks. This will mean when you go onto a record, 
at the moment you get a button that says do you want to download this as a JSON file, which may mean something to some of you. There will be another button that says do you want to download the citation to this? And we hope at that time it will also then have that permanent URL in that citation. <coughs> And you can choose which format you want to download in. You can choose MLA or Chicago if you're an academic. You can choose Wikitree if you use Wikitree, Family Tree Online if you use that, um, Legacy if you use Legacy, and Evidence Explained if you use Evidence Explained. We did some research about what people use and we found most useful. We can go on and add more if you're going, oh no, they missed my favorite way I use it. Um, on free reg, the, the, another, oh, sorry, uh, another project we did on the Google Summer of Code, which is about probate, but my colleague is going to talk about that later, so I will skip over that. Um, image management on free reg, We've had some fabulous volunteers working on image management and a lot of the coordinators on Free Reg are trialling it at the moment. This will completely change how transcribers, coordinators and researchers can understand what we've got, what's available for transcription, what exists but we don't necessarily have it. It may be that it's in a record office or a church that hasn't given us permission to have the images, or which has been destroyed. So if you're looking for a death record in a certain parish at a certain time, and we know that that burial register was destroyed, you'll know that you will not find it through a burial register. Also on Free Sen, we have just started looking at potential to do online transcriptions using a existing tool that is used by a lot of other transcribers mostly using records from the united states and from jewish communities across europe um, we've only done it at the moment with a transcriber <coughs> a single transcriber transcribing a piece um, we're going to look at the quality that comes out of that to see how that compares to the traditional method of transcription. And we're also going to do it, run it again, inviting anybody, whether they're transcribed or not, to have a go and see whether they can are working on the same piece, to see with that whether that kind of free-for-all transcription results in any loss of quality compared to an experienced trained transcriber. And then we should decide whether to progress with that or not based on how useful it is and how good the transcriptions are. That's the end of my short update, but do grab me over lunch. Everybody seems to be up. So, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, right. So, my talk is on the the past, present, and future. Um, this is part of a talk that I often give to um, family history societies, but the audience there are people who don't really know much about um, free UK genealogy or either free projects. So um, there's quite a lot of it that I have to cut out that wasn't that relevant to, um, to the audience we have today, where all of you are pretty much involved in projects. Um, I will, I've only got 20 minutes. It's often, as a talk, this takes about. Um, even though it has taken three hours in the past, so <laughs> I, I won't do that, I won't do that, but um, so I'm going to rush a little bit, I'll skim through a few of the slides. Um, it is focused on free BMD rather than free UK Gen, uh, sorry, rather than free Sen, free Reg. So. Right, so, yeah. who am I? I'm a trustee of free BMD, one of the original ones with Benny Miller, who are the bank who started the project. We'll talk about that now. Um, yeah, the agenda is to talk about the past, how it all started, the set along the way. The present, I'll look very briefly at where we are now, and then in the future, talk about a couple of the projects that we've got ongoing, but mainly focusing on the process we went through, especially in the early days to get the projects on. Okay, so what is it? You all know what this is anyway. Free Free Gen Energy is a parent charity for three projects. Right, where is Free Gen D? Well, this was the um, uh, 
and this is what we have in our trust scheme as to what PMD was originally. So these are the things that were meant to be. There are two main things that we're, we're entitled to provide an electronic database that can refer to interest and death indexes, and then subject to consent of other relevant authorities, we can transcribe other databases as necessary. How did we start it? Well, years ago, in the um, mid-90s, a guy called Dr. Brian Leverage, who was the founder of RootsWeb, um, decided to form a society called the International Internet Genealogical Society. And in that, that was an idea of a whole load of um, people, of genealogists worldwide, coming together on the internet and trying to work together to um, set up just anything we could just to help each other, lots of chat rooms, lots of editing. It was a, it was a massive attempt and uh, um, took you know, a large part of our minds for a couple of years. It was incredibly busy. And that's where I met then, and then I met online um, in various chat rooms. Um, and we, we had a discussion about what could we achieve if the online genealogists worked together. There were potentially thousands of volunteers, and how, you know, what could we manage to do if we got everyone together? So that, that was the discussion we had online. Um, after that, I went away and put a few figures together to try and work out what I was going to do, or what we might do. And I, you know, we were saying, what should we transcribe? So the, the necessity of it was it had to be global because we were trying to get um, an international transcription project. The source has to be available to everyone. We wouldn't be able to supply source to everyone. Um, uh, there has to be an interest, obviously, otherwise people, people wouldn't transcribe it. Uh, it has to be useful, otherwise people wouldn't use it. So, and so we came to the conclusion that the best thing was the GRO birth registry death registers. At the time, they were in St. Catherine's house and had the big books, and everyone, I'm sure, remembers going there, grabbing the books, bringing them off the shelves, finding where you were sitting, opening them up. Looking for it, realizing you've got the wrong thing to go back and do it again. <laughs> and just keep repeating, spending all day there and coming back with arms aching and uh, about five records. Um, <clears throat> and also, the feature was available in libraries, so we're in a position to um, you know, allow people overseas to, um, to get the source. So that was our decision on that one. Um, our initial thoughts. Um, so, when, when I, first, um, I wrote something up and sent it to them, you know, that's my um, things were the transcribers would research as normal, so you would turn up. In your normal way, whether it's St. Catherine's House or going to the feature of course, you just turn up as normal and you would research as normal. But when you found a record, you would transcribe 10 or 20 either side of that record. So we were just imagining that you would just go there, take that one, and then transcribe a certain number either side of it and submit those um, to the project. Um, and we imagined that we would have different transcriber types. You'd have the casual transcriber, who's the person who just occasionally goes there and does you know, a few a few trips um, a year, and we'd do, um, you know, we'd just transcribe a few of them. You'd have a medium transcriber, people who regularly went there, and would you know, do their own research, but would um, transcribe fairly regularly. And then we imagined the intense ones where people would go there just for the project, and they would actually transcribe deliberately for the project. And depending on the numbers of people we had across um, each of those, we imagined that, well, we actually worked out that um, the project was possible, but it would take a long time, and not within our lifetimes. Um, uh, but that wasn't something that was going to get in the way, so we decided to go ahead with it anyway, because why not? Um, just on the basis of these transcriber times, of course, the reality is that we got completely different transcriber times, and the process that we did was completely different, and the ones we ended up with were an insane transcriber <laughs> <laughs> For a long time, we had, we had two million plus records a month going into the site, and um, you know, to be able to get that worldwide, and have two million records a month, yeah, insane things that we would put it, but you know, we wouldn't have done it without it. The project startup. So, um, having decided and discussed it, decided it was something we wanted to do at that stage, um, I think if it had been up to me, I'm, I'm not very good at moving things on, so I probably would have left it there and thought it was a good idea to put it on the side. But Ben and Camilla, much more organised than I am, and, uh, and they wrote to the ONS to say, Can we do it? And we spent a long time waiting for it to come back. I can't remember exactly how long, but we spent a long time waiting for it to come back. And eventually, we did get something back. You know, on, the, on the 18th of May, they sent something back which had a few discussion points, and then they sent a final agreement on the 30th of July 98, which gave us permission to transcribe. Now, you probably can't read this, but that is the letter. You can't read it. So, we had um, four, uh, four or five things. So, we could only publish records that were 100 years old. Uh, access to the information had to be free of charge. We had to include a, a crown copyright acknowledgement. And um, an instruction to end users to say that they mustn't copy on transfer, etc., etc., without prior permission of the ONS. Um, and 
as the suggestion was earlier. But that was our formal, yes, you can read this letter that they can kick a project off. So as you see, that was 20 years ago, last year. Uh, project Santa. Well, we requested, oh yeah, sorry, just something. We had 100 things to talk about, you know, loads, loads of things to think about. Um, there was the programming, the formats, the you know, data format, what would we put in the database, what forms would we ask people to um, submit data in, how would we manage to keep consistency in the data frame, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the source, where would the source come from? Well, at this stage, we had no source, particularly in our own, well, we had none of our own. Um, so how would we allow people to get the source and then how would we have them up? Uh, the project structure, the whole, whole idea, how, how would we organize something where there were effectively three of us trying to run this thing or trying to get it organized, how would we run it? And we were all busy with our normal day jobs as well, so I can't remember to do it. Um, and some of the steps. So website hosting was produced, was um, provided by Roots Web. So Brian Devlich, who is some of the International Genealogy Society, um, kindly gave us a, first of all, a test machine, and then gave us a live machine that we could use. So for a long time, we were running on Roots Web um, hardware. And our URL was um, premium.rootsweb.com is our original URL. Uh, the programming, Ben and I did it. And Ben did most of the hard work, and I did the, um, some of the software again. We did a bit of coordination. So um, uh, and Camilla got organized a little lots of the organization stuff and things. Uh, definitely necessary and needed. We got we got fish, we managed to get hold of some fish, we bought some fish, we got a fish printer and we printed off um, various copies of those and we sent them out to people. So initially we were actually posting the fish out to the prints of fish out to people, um, which was again quite interesting and quite a logistical nightmare, but we managed to do it. And we set up mailing this. And most importantly, of course, we have transcribers and coordinators. We wouldn't have anywhere without them. So those were some of the early steps we went through in uh, 98. We had two rules. So um, we, we found early on that we had some experience um, with uh, internet forums. And I'm sure everyone's had the same experiences, which is that if two people can mark you, they will, no matter what. Uh, so we had two rules. Our first rule was control lies with the trustees, as in, you know, what if we have a discussion and I'm quite happy with it, but ultimately the three of us would make a decision and that would be the decision. So we just had a point to say that's the end of the discussion and um, you know, uh, that, just stop discussions going on and on endlessly. And the second one, which you probably all know if you're a big transcriber, is type what you see. The whole idea of type what you see is that it's easy for us programmatically to make adjustments and show adjustments later on. But if you type something that's not there, we can lose that piece of information forever. So if you type what you see and you say, I can't see this letter, I don't know what it is, it could be an A or, a, or an E, then write that down and that information is held. Subsequently, we can do all the variations of that word that would include the A and the E, we can allow people to, to build that. But if you just guess it's an E, then no one in the future knows that that might be an A, and that might be critical to some researching. Obviously more critical in terms of um, <coughs> districts for free BMD, so it's, if, if it's in Georgia the East, and someone just wrote down St. George, and you think it's St. George News, but it could be St. George and Hanover Square, it could be any of the hundreds of St. George's that exist in London. Um, and so if you're second guessing, um, then we lose the information if you don't type what you see. So that was quite critical. Um, the structure of FreeBMD, um, I think you probably know this, uh, syndicates. So we set up syndicates and said we would have a coordinator, and then it was up to the coordinator to work with their transcribers and manage their transcribers. That offloaded the load from the three of us so that we could um, you know, rely on coordinators to do that. That's obviously still the fundamental structure we have. I'm sure quite a few of you are free and syndicate coordinators. Um, yeah, sorry, sit there again. Okay, same thing, no, no, the coordinators would, would um, control and track it. Oh no, sorry, syndicate coordinator, I'm going to So the syndicate coordinator, that was Alan Raymond. I don't know if Alan's here today, actually. Thanks. Um, Alan Raymond uh, was our syndicate coordinator and managed the coordinators and, and still does. And he's done that job now for 20 years and uh, he does it very well. Uh, and we also set up a district payments team. I put them there because they're often the hidden people behind FreeBMD that people don't know about. So the district payments team are the people who take all the mistranscriptions of districts and map them into what we think the correct district is so that when you do a search, it maps in. I'll show one of the stats a bit later on um, as the as to how many they were doing per month at one, one stage in the project. And a quality coordinator. So the idea was we would always do, uh, we would double key the records. And by double keying the records, um, that would, that's the way that we would get the quality. So um, you know, key the records twice, 
um, yet yeah, to give us give us a quality. Text structure programming, obviously, web developers, BBMD and WinBMD, both tools that were written for us by volunteers to allow people to transcribe um, transcribe on their PCs. BBMD was DOS based, WinBMD was Windows based. Then someone wrote a Mac version of it, someone wrote a Linux version of it. And then we ended up with BMD Verify, which is a great tool that um, tracks the scans that you've got and the line you're currently transcribing as you transcribe it leads to the scan, it leads a highlight down on the scan so you can see it. Uh, without without these tools, we wouldn't have got very well. Project cost. So how do we how do we obviously we had no money at that stage. What do we do? So initially sponsorship. Rootsweb um, gave us the hardware and they gave us the bandwidth and they allowed us to uh, to use their service. That was the initial way we did it. After a while, Rootsweb got bought out by Ancestry, and when when that happened, Ancestry carried on supporting us, but we actually went to a formal agreement with them where they were sponsoring us. Giving us some money as well as the um, so that we could pay for our hosting, um, and uh, we in return they were able to show the records on their site, but they had to be shown free, so there was a, you know, they couldn't charge for them. But they had to be accessible through the um, through Ancestry site, but in a, in a free route. Um, we don't have any sponsorship now. We stopped the Ancestry deal once we became self-sufficient with our own um, our own income streams, and we didn't want to be. The holder to one of the major um, genealogy uh, sites. So, um, yeah. And our main streams now is advertising. So initially, with Ancestry, we were we were showing Ancestry ads. We now show ads from lots of other places, whether it's Google AdSense or wherever. And and um, there's quite a lot of work that goes on to make sure that those ads are giving us the the return we want. And the money from those ads are what um, fundamentally um, pays for three DMT. In fact, three UK gen, three UK gen. Uh, source, talk about source. So initially it was find your own. So we were just basically saying, okay, you're going to transcribe this, just go and find your own source. Go, you know, if you, your local library or if you can get to the ONS or the um, St. Catherine's House or the Family Record Centre. Um, then we did fiche and printed copies of fiche, which was quite difficult, but we did that. Then finally we got scans of film. So um, we were donated at various times, we were donated some, some films, we ended up with a scanner and um, we managed to get through the scan of films. Um, and then finally, initially, we weren't allowed to show those images or, or publish them anywhere. And um, eventually, um, the permission came through that we could publish them, and then we were able to put the images onto our server. And what people do now is to, is to go to the server, download an image, and then transcribe that image so you no longer have to go anywhere else. But prior to that, you had to find your, find your source from somewhere else, and the coordinators would typically try and do that. Uh, we've had donations of film copies from both groups. Um, and a copy of all the images are now up on the site. So as you know, if you search FreeBMD, you find a record, you can click into it and see the original scan. And you should always do that because you should double check that it hasn't been mistranscribed so you can see the scan and have a look at it. If it's wrong, you can submit a correction. Um, and all transcriptions are performed using film scans. Source, why not OCR? Okay, so one of the things we had was, um, why, should, why shouldn't we just, um, just do this with OCR? Well, uh, for type entries, 90% at the time, 90% was considered good for OCR. But if you have a 90% success rate, that means you've got a 10% failure rate. And 10% failure rate would give us approximately one error in every two records, um, and which is just not acceptable. In, in something like FreeBMD, where every word counts, there isn't, there's no superfluous information on there, if you get an error in every two records, we'd end up with um, a database that wasn't worth um, using. So uh, OCR didn't really work out. We were going through a lot of other things at the same time, which I'll just touch on briefly. So at the same time, there was a project going on, I think it was still called Project Up, or maybe I'll talk a bit later on, but there was a project going on for the government to um, <clears throat> to transcribe the indexes, and they would then do their own transcription and make them available to everyone. And there was a lot of criticism that we were doing something that would just be a complete waste of time. And at the time, we, we put the argument together that was, that we, we much as the government wants to put the money into it, as soon as there would be a, a change of government, they would then snatch the funds, they would have to think about it again and restart it again, and, and the project would never complete. And as we said, we would rather get 10 or 20 years down the line and then the project become um, uh, useless than, than go 20 years down the line and think we should start the project now. Um, I think that, that's, that's held out. So the government, I think, have gone through three or four iterations of trying to transcribe the records. And they still haven't completed them or even really started it in anger. So, um, uh, yeah, I think it was the right decision at the time. Uh, 
uh, handwritten entries, yeah, for OCR, handwritten entries, of course, um, OCR is just terrible. Quality assurance with double keying. Um, you'd use separate syndicates to double key so that you don't have the same people um, transcribing the same thing twice because they'll see the same errors. And um, ideally with separate sorts, although that's not always um, possible. Uh, and the system compares the sequence of entries with some code that Ben wrote, and he's stolen it from the Human Genome Project that um, matched DNA sequences. Uh, and the results are indicated in the status of the record. So when you look at the record, depending on its shade, it tells you whether that record's been single keyed or double keyed. Uh, the timeline of the project, right, this is um, a lot of <coughs> gunk about what happened throughout all the various years that we were doing, so I'll, I'll skip through a lot of this. 1998, we got the permission. July to December, we did a lot of development about processes and code. We got some volunteers to come in and help out. We were calling for volunteers, but not ready to accept transcriptions, accept test transcriptions. Um, the yeah, the previous the admin system was created on the 18th of September. The 30th of September, we did a formal announcement to announce the project to the world. Um, in December, we got a dedicated server from Rootsweb, which became our live machine, and we went live at the end of December. In 1999, Dave Mayo joined us as, a, as a, one of the three, uh, what became the fourth owner of the project. Uh, we had a new logo, the Freedom D logo, uh, up the top left without the gap print. Um, <clears throat> district agencies, we were very pleased to hit 90,000 records, 100,000 records. I was talking to Ben just now, and um, one of the things that Ben was running database updates, he could run multiple a day at that time. Um, nowadays, it takes the best part of three weeks to run an update. Um, but whenever we ran the update, Ben included an estimate of when we felt the um, project would finish. And we were just talking about one, we remembered when it when the answer came within the scope of actually fitting into um, a 32-bit integer, which means it you know, basically could actually show the answer. And then secondly, we all got excited when it became within our lifetime. Um, <laughs> that was a major point. We thought we actually might finish this before our lifetime. Um, actually, in March, the in March, we got a letter from the ONS giving formal instructions for people who own the um, fish and own films, so these are libraries around the world, giving them instructions on, on basically saying that they, they could write to the ONS and the ONS would give them permission to show those and allow free and people to transcribe them. So we got a form through through. We're finding some resistance in libraries around the world that they couldn't um, show that they couldn't let us uh, transcribe. Syndicate management facilities, etc. I won't go through all of these because there's loads of them. We hit a million records in 2000, then we hit two million records in 2000, then three million records in 2000. So you know, for us, you know, just seeing that rate of increase was, was, was incredible. We didn't expect anything like it. And then 2001, we were at 5,000. We were hitting 720 entries a month, 720,000 entries a month. An ancestry purchased a set of films. So if that, that's not completely true, 1837 to 1900, we got a set of films which gave us the early in the early years that we could then see. Um, in May, we hit 10 million entries and we were doing 2 million transcriptions per month. Um, and in July, July, uh, Ian Brook launched Wind AMD and David Lane launched uh, DMD Verify, both of which are tools that we could have done without. Okay, we had 3,000 transcribers at the end of that. So I won't I won't skip to go through all of these. 2003 was a big year. We formed a charity. We formed a charity because there were always um, comments going on that, that as a project we had set something up that we were eventually going to sell and make, it, make ourselves millionaires. Um, you know, that was never the case. So we're not millionaires now. Um, uh, but we decided to form a charity to make it very clear that, that the money that comes out of the project gets invested back into the project and that no one's making a profit out of it. Um, permission from the ONS to include all records. So they removed the 100 year rule. Prior to that, we couldn't show any records that were 100 years. Um, less than 100 years old, or less than 100 years old. But at that point, we could then show them and start to transcribe themselves, and that was a major thing. The district alias team, I mentioned to, I mentioned them earlier a bit. So at this stage, they were doing a thousand new district spellings every month. So basically every month with the um, two million transactions, two million records we were getting, transcriptions we were getting, out of those, there were um, typically a thousand districts that never appeared and didn't fit in the district thing. And they had to go through each of them and map them to say what they thought they was. What they thought they were. Now they use a, a mix of things. The, the volume number and the page range for the particular year um, is allocated to a particular district. So they would use those to work those districts out. 
And then in the programming in the background, we would then show the correct district, but with a indicator that what the, you know what, what we thought the district was. So you, you would see both. Quality control reports started coming out. Suspect files and duplicate files that allows coordinators to know whether they duplicated some of the data or um, and suspect files are files that we felt were wrong. Maybe the heading was wrong, or they, they were in the wrong year, or they, they overlap certain things. Um, and we started to buy film from the ONS, and we started to get it trained. Then we started to get it scanned. Archive CD books. Rob Neep, um, who also happens to be the person who started Free Reg, um, scanned those for free for us, which was very nice too. Uh, Seventy-one million records at that stage. Six thousand transcribers and two point seven million per month, which is probably about close to our peak of transcriptions per month. I think around that time, we had two new servers dedicated to the scan. Uh, free send, so 2005, Free Send and Free Reg joined Free BMD as part of the charity. So we incorporated them into the charity and we started to uh, uh, use our funds to support their service as well at that point. <coughs> uh, let's see. Uh, in 2007, the Society of Genealogists awarded us the Prince Michael of Kent Award, which was the Distinguished and Outstanding Services of Genealogy. It had only been awarded three times previously, and we were very proud to get that. Um, and then marriages after 1912 and searchable life spouse, and we were up to 135 million records. 2008, I'll just skip to these now, I'm not there. 2008, directors request at 5,000 a month. So Kevin Howells, who has now unfortunately died, um, was at that time dealing with 2,500 collections every month himself. So he was going to and sorting them out himself. Massive um, amount of work he got through, as well as doing a lot of the scanning for us. Um, and the other, the other two and a half thousand were handled by the syndicates or by the volunteers. So he was dealing with ones where the transcriber had disappeared or the syndicate wasn't clear. Um, and we hit 200 million records. In 2009, we added Alan Raymond as a trustee. Um, 2010, we got a new executive director. Also, we had Pat now as our executive director. But um, uh, we decided that it was a bit too difficult for the three or four of us to manage the project. We're all busy with our normal. Uh, lifetime, our normal day, day jobs, and we weren't really able to focus on what was now quite a big project, and especially all of the governance aspects of it. So we decided to get an executive director in to help us move this forward. And Nick Brown was the first one. We increased numbers of directors. We um, we we had Darren White became our executive director, and then Pat came in 2015. Um, and we have trustees. We now have quite a few trustees, and that brings us through to the present day where we are now. So the present day, we need to move on. Okay, next. So these are all about trustees as it stands at the moment. Um, Alexandra has just joined us as trustee, she's talking next. Um, uh, the support team, so this is our support team. Now at the moment, these are um, generally people that we, we pay to do the work. If we didn't pay them to do the work, what we found with the volunteers, especially from the programming side and the um, management side of things, is things just didn't get done. We couldn't move things on because we couldn't guarantee the um, time that people were putting in. Um, and although there's a few of them, all of them are part-time, and we, the effective cost is the, is the equivalent of three people, effectively three people um, working for us, a mix of technical and uh, organisational. Uh, we have teams that look after each of the projects and the development group. Um, and how far are we now? So, um, as we're at the moment, there's 269 million distinct records. So, distinct records are records that um, don't count the double key, so if they've been double keyed, we forget the double key. So they're the individual records. So you have two, 269 million distinct records on the site at the moment, 345 total records, which include the double key people. Transcription rate is currently 600,000 per month, so still very high given where we are. Um, not as high as it used to be in the first one. And searches yesterday were 131,000 um, searches during yesterday. The future, okay. Um, we want to complete the first scan. Now, at the moment, um, Andrew, no, sorry, Alan Raymond gave us a um, estimate. He reckons it will be done either at the end of the end of this quarter, at uh, the end of this year, or early next year. So, at the moment, we think that's our target for completing the, the first set of data up to 1984. The second set of data is, is quite different. We've done 75 million so far, and we've got 269 million in total, so it's still quite a way to go. But obviously, some people will move from the first transcription into the second transcription, so that will then move on faster. But that will be going on in the background. You know, that's our first things completed. Free MD2, we've got the new website. So um, uh, I think Pat mentioned uh, we're, we're going to have a website for Free MD that will um, match the Free Send and Free Reg newly designed websites. 
Open data. Okay, we talked about open data a fair bit in this project, so I want to touch on it briefly now. So when we started FreeBMD, we wanted to make sure that these things were available so that people could use them and make sure they're available free. FreeBMD data and free set data and free reg data will always be available free on the Free UK Gen websites. We will always keep them available free, so we'll never change that. What we're looking at with open data is that because we, we now have such a good data set, we would really like people to use it. So if someone wants to work and write a project where they want to work out the distribution of a surname across different geographical regions, or they want to do all sorts of things using our data, whether it's free send, free reg, or, or free BMD, or they want to link them together and do stuff, by doing open data, we allow them to access our data. They can write something. Now, if they write something and spend their time doing it, and it's worthwhile for the genealogy community, then we feel that they should be able to charge for that if they want. They will provide something. If they provide something that isn't very good, then people won't buy it. Um, and and also, if they provide something that's easy to do, then then you know someone else can you know, will come and undercut them and do, do do the same thing. So at the end of the day, this will balance out. The idea of this is to get allow people to be a bit entrepreneurial in what they want to achieve and to get better use of the data out there. So rather than just say, well, here it is, we now want to use the computing power of the internet, all the you know, all the other systems we've got, machine learning, etc try and get, you know, to try and make the best use of what is now a fantastic resource. The uh, Society of Genealogists, we've got agreement with the Society of Genealogists to, um, they will show free BMD, free rate and free SEN on their website, um, and in return, um, in return we, we, we get some uh, sponsorship back and some advertising back through their thing, which is, so that's been signed and sealed. Upcoming projects, free probate, okay, free probate, which we, might call free will, but it's free will. <laughs> Apparently, it's, you know, it's can't be free will because the domain names aren't available. To it. Um, so, free free probate. We've had th these are the probate records from um, is it 1858? Yeah, it's, it's 1858 onwards. They're the standard probate indexes that um, that are available in other places, but we want to make them available as well. The um, books were given to us by the Oxford Family History Society, and uh, we're getting them. We've already got them scanned. We had someone working over the summer, in as part of the um, summer of COVID, thing, looking at machine learning to read the records and identify the um, who the testator was, who the witnesses were, who who uh, beneficiaries are, and so they can pull the data out. So that's that's going to run through the machine learning exercise. Now, interestingly, we are using OCR for this. You know, um, the reason this is more relevant for OCR than the other records is uh, than the BND records is because there's a lot more. It's a lot more textual. So if 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 you've got the word, um, you know, if you've got the word marriage in there, and the I is missing, you're still going to guess that's marriage. You're going to be able to read it. It's not the same as um, missing records out of a uh, missing letters out of a, um, a BMG record. Um, and that's underway at the moment. So we have we have this machine learning thing, and that's all now ready to go. The machine learning code is there, and the process will be to, to start to put that all through the system, and then. Um, our tech team is going to start writing the interfaces and the search engines for that to allow that to become searchable. Uh, free pass place. Okay, free pass place is um, working with linked data. So pass place um, have information about location. So locations aren't just in you know, the way they put it. They're not just space. They're space and time. So if you're in, um, you know, if you're if you're in Middlesex at a particular time, the borders of Middlesex change completely, or the the um, Villages and towns and parishes change over time. So the idea, the idea with free pass space is to link, is to enable to link our projects up into their geographical databases. So that if someone's sitting there saying, "I want to find this, I want to find that," they can do again do some analysis that will identify, yes, that person could have been in these places or those places, or whatever. So it's a it's a beginning of one that Richard is um, heavily involved in. Um, Richard, like, I'm talk about it yet, Richard. Uh, access to the mother's maiden name at the age of death. So the GRO searches at the moment, I'm sure you all know that if you go to the GRO searches, you can get the mother's maiden name for all the births. It's incredibly useful, and um, as a genealogist, I use it all the time. And age of death data is also on there um, for um, earlier than it's available in normally in indexes. Now we would like to have that available for free BMD. We'd like to put it against our records, and then we would allow people to search across the full range. At the moment, you can only search a maximum of five years. You have to put a name in there, you have to put a sex in there, various other restrictions. We'd like to enable that to just be a standard search across um, FreeBMD, uh, but we're waiting to hear whether we can get access to those records. Uh, our future, well, this is it. Yeah, we're going to continue to transcribe until it's complete, continue to push for full availability and transcription of the original records, 
and continue to support the free access to records. slides, I'm a fairly new trustee of uh, pre-UK genealogy, but I'm also a professional archivist by background. Uh, my current day job is, is Collections Information Manager and Welcome Collection. Um, and so my talk today on crowdsourcing is going to be drawing on that professional experience. And I'm currently also co-editing a book on participatory archives, which covers everything from um, crowdsource transcription to crowdfunding to some kind of social justice type projects uh, in uh, the, all of which are based on news archival sources of one kind or another um, but it also draws particularly on research that I carried out on online participation in the archive sphere as part of uh, a PhD um, between 2010 when crowdsourcing was a fairly unknown term amongst my profession and fellow kind of sectors in libraries, museums, um, right up to 2015, by which time it had become a little bit more established, and particularly well established, I think, for indexing and classification tasks. Um, and it's striking, I think, to note that many of the, the, the most successful projects I encountered as part of that research and not quite more feedback. Is that just me? Can you have to move on? Move it a bit. Is that that's worse. Okay. I'll hold it here so people can hear. Um, some of the, the, the most successful projects I came across as part of that research. Um, okay. So <laughs> Um, what have been genealog uh, genealogical, or they started out indexing personal names of, of one kind to another. Um, and you'll see some of the quotes I'll, I'll share later in this presentation that have been contributed to a Dutch project called uh, Bella Handen, uh, meaning many hands in Dutch, as in many hands make light work, um, which was inaugurated by Amsterdam City Archives in 2010 with an experiment uh, to index the city's militia registers. And it's since grown into a, a highly successful crowdsourcing platform for Dutch speaking um, contributors. Independently, in the same year, 2010, a project to index Danish police registration records began in Copenhagen. Um, by the way, I've added some URLs to these uh, as my final slide if anyone uh, wants to look them up uh, afterwards. Um, and one or two people in the room may know uh, the American software developer Ben Bromfield, I think he's been involved in the advisory group, but, um, yeah, um, who, who was inspired by his own great great grandmother's diaries to start what to become a, a major um, collaborative transcription software project. Um, so actually, just before I go any further, I thought I'd ask a very quick show of hands for people in the room. How many of you would consider yourselves to be crowdsourcers? Okay. Um, and how many of you would say you were active volunteers on one of the free UK genealogy projects? Much more. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually really interesting because I think cultural heritage domains generally crowdsourcing is particularly associated with distributed transcription activities. Um, and I think many of my fellow professionals as archivists would consider volunteer um, genealogy indexing as a kind of archetypal crowdsourcing success story. Um, collaboration, after all, is a key component to success for today's genealogists. So whether that's discussions with uh, fellow um, family historians on Facebook or Twitter or um, compiling an online tree, um, most of today's family historians are familiar and relatively comfortable with the idea of sharing their knowledge um, and <coughs> using their skills online. That isn't necessarily true of some other historical research communities, um, particularly perhaps academics who tend to be a bit more guarded about their expertise and slightly less willing to contribute maybe without direct benefit to themselves. After all, this is their, their livelihood that they're having to deal with. Um, this is a dictionary definition of crowdsourcing. Um, and obviously, crowdsourcing is a, a term that combines crowd and outsourcing. Um, it was first coined in an article in Wired magazine in 2006, so it's been around for 12 years. 
Um, now, obviously, this definition um, is pretty broad. It has to be broad enough to encompass all kinds of online contributory behaviour, uh, from Wikipedia, say, to reviews on TripAdvisor, uh, right through to some really quite uh, ethically um, questionable, maybe, human behaviour. Um, people would have called human intelligence tasks, which are advertised on uh, Amazon account or Turk. Um, but if you remove um, the option for paid work um, and the dependency on the internet, you should be able to see quite a lot of um, commonality, I think, between crowdsourcing and volunteering, uh, and volunteering of the kind that should be familiar uh, to most of those who put their hands up, and I said, who, who, who sees themselves as a contributor as opposed to as a crowdsourcer. So in other words, I think you could legitimately view um, AMD and its, its uh, cousins as uh, crowdsourcing pioneers, um, or kind of analogues which predate crowdsourcing. And when you look at collaborative volunteering of the, the free gen kind, um, and this is uh, a kind that you also see reflected, I think, in family history societies up and down the country, um, the volunteering tends to coalesce around certain shared community interests. Um, and then those community interests get translated online when the projects transfer to the internet. So in the case of family history volunteering, um, participation, which is often a transcription activity of some kind, usually requires pretty dedicated contributor cognitive effort, and it's sustained in some way by social interaction. We're all here today in, in the room. Um, well, it's often quite challenging, often uh, difficult. Uh, it may involve um, transcribing uh, sometimes an entire register, say, or at least a, a whole page. Um, but even where data entry is the responsibility of a single individual and it's, it's completed online, um, so it's, it's done online because that's good. nowadays that's convenient, even in those circumstances, volunteers will quite commonly need to first say or training or just to um, just have a chat or to discuss progress um, towards an open ended course. And if you look at um, for UK's current mission to create high quality transcriptions of public records from um, government sources, parish churches, and other trusted institutions. It's a classic mission statement that kind of fits this community um, conception of what we do, at least I would say so. Um, the quote is from a uh, contributor to the Historical Citizen Science site of Weather. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but I included it to demonstrate that contributors to, uh, even where the projects are entirely on, online, they often testify to this kind of community experience in, in the way um, interactions develop with fellow participants, um, other participants act as motivators, sources of support, friendship and camaraderie. Uh, the motivation is often, or, or generally, is, is some kind of intrinsic motivation, uh, with um, altruistic uh, elements to it. There was, I noticed there was a quote on the slideshow at the beginning from somebody who said he wanted to give back to the MD, wanted um, uh, taken from it as a researcher. Um, and so commitment extends well beyond completing just a single task or um, just dealing with the subject matter directly in front of them. So rather if you're um, part of a crowdsourcing community, you would be inspired and encouraged by a sense of belonging to a fairly trusted group of people with similar interests. Um, and the discussion that goes on in these kind of communities can reveal new perspectives, things you haven't thought about in terms of the sources you're transcribing, it distributes contextual knowledge, it's also a mechanism for a very rapid problem solving if you can't read a particular entry or um, something of that kind. Reciprocity is key characteristic of these kind of communities and the, the coordinators or moderators of uh, roles in online projects are usually drawn from this core community set of participants. So I hope all of that sounds fairly familiar as contributors uh, to free gen projects. Uh, but you've probably heard too uh, of a, a phenomenon or characteristic long tail of participation in crowdsourcing projects and this is where 
but you get a skewed pattern of participation where the majority of contributors um, uh, actually, in fact, contribute very little individually, perhaps as little as a single transcription, but a few super contributors seem to kind of turn the project into a, a, almost a full time job. I guess this is very insane um, contributors. Um, this is now quite an old, but I, I like it because it's colourfully graphic uh, illustration of this phenomenon for the old, the original old web project, um, which uh, was uh, participants were asked to transcribe weather data from uh, Royal Navy logbooks, um, what's here, the National Archives, um, and uh, for climate <coughs> research purposes. But despite its scientific objectives, um, this project actually uh, attracted quite a considerable number of genealogists who were more interested in the narrative related in the logbooks, um, in which their um, the logbooks were from ships that their ancestors had served in. Um, so, in this infographic, um, each box represents one person who's transcribed at least one page of weather in 2012. Um, the area of the box is proportional to the number of pages transcribed. So um, the, the large pink box at the, the top left is the person who's done the most transcriptions. Um, part of my study of, of, of weather as part of my PhD was aiming to uncover more about the casual engagement of the micro volunteering experiences of the people um, that are represented in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and I was also interested in the factors that were discouraging participation. And in doing this, I discovered quite a lot about what differentiates the full crowd, everybody represented on this infographic, um, from the online transcription community that is, is the kind of core of the, the super um, transcribers, the people that do the most at, at the top left. Um, but I also came a, a little bit counterintuitively, maybe, to see quite a lot of value in focusing more attention on the needs of the, the, and the motivations of the tech of the people at the bottom right. Because this is the entry point um, for new contributors, and it's also potentially a dormant form of kind of latent talent which you might tempt back into, into greater activity. Um, so one way I like to think about crowds is to think of them as kind of upside down communities. Um, I mentioned how um, community members are, are very from their committees to a challenge, but you'll only attract a crowd if the entry threshold is comparatively low um, and preferably open to all comers. Busy people can't necessarily take on the transcription of uh, a whole register or, or uh, even just a page. But they might be willing to do just um, the odd entry here and there between other activities. So the people that are, are participants in a crowd tend to put participation around their day to day life um, rather than it being an activity for which they make time specifically. Um, and there was uh, this interestingly came up in the board meeting this morning. There was quite a strong seasonal fluctuation actually to people's participation when I spoke to them. So it was something they were more likely to pick up in the winter months um, rather than when it was sunny and they preferred to be outside. So uh, again, whereas communities are socially motivated, um, they're also constrained to some degree by the limits, limitations of this in-person communication. Um, and crowds also, in contrast, tend to appeal to participants across a wide geographic uh, distribution. Uh, very often across time zones, um, and possibly as you'd expect with a crowd, some participants prefer to remain anonymous. So for the percent of the Dutch project I told you a little bit about, um, in, in their first project, 4% of those participants lived outside of the Netherlands, that's quite harmless in the United States and Australia. Crowd contributors also tend to be more specifically task-focused, and they're motivated uh, by results in pursuit of um, quick goals, and I forgot to uh, put that up, I'll give you two seconds to read that. Um, and those fixed goals might in some instances be um, stimulated or rewarded by competition against other participants. Now, this idea that transcription or, or indexing activities could be turned into some kind of game where participants compete against each other to make the most contributions, um, 
the idea that their main motivation for taking part might simply be to have fun. Um, that tends to be quite an alien concept to uh, people who come from the more traditional community orientated volunteering background. Um, and I might say uh, to people from my profession who are very suspicious of uh, a lot of this uh, so called gamification type of crowdsourcing. But particularly, I think when tasks are uh, pretty repetitive, they might be mundane or trivial, um, gamification can actually be quite effective in focusing participants' attention on a fixed term or a short term goal. Um, and it acts kind of as a, an additional extrinsic reward, um, validating the contribution in some limited sense. It's often particularly effective for thinking in new contributors. Um, and particularly so in the early phases of a, of a project when everybody's competing on a pretty level playing field. But gamification, which I can say is a term I hate, but there's no level alternative, um, it comes with a caveat. So the emotional reaction to achieving a promotion on board runner or a, a high score on the project leaderboards, um, so the, the the cadets and lieutenants, captains, Mark Weber, the, the illustration on the right is from the Dutch project with a family leaderboard. Um, that, that emotional reaction is very often pretty fleeting. Um, it's clear that there is always some high scoring participants who are spurred on by kind of buying for this top position, but the low scoring participants are very often simultaneously demotivated by this distant competition, they, they have no hope of reaching, they can't turn their participation into a full-time job, um, they just can't keep up, um, they find it stressful, exhausting, and they may just find the competitive system trivialising or even that it undervalues small contributions in some ways. Um, and I, I even spoke to some more occasional participants who, were, who just deliberately disregarded it or were completely unaware of it existed. So it's a kind of double-edged sword competition, um, but it does, in some senses, in, in some instances, answer the purpose. Um, I think one of the problems with competition is that it, it's effectively an attempt to motivate contributors by encouraging interaction of some kind. It's not social interaction in this instance, it's competitive, but it's still interaction. Um, and so it holds very little appeal for um, micro volunteers who quite frankly would rather be left alone to make their own choices about what they need to do and when. So um, like the competitors, there's a section of the crowd who are still interested in having fun in pursuit of the short-term goal. But the challenge here is much more personal to the participant. It's quite uh, common to describe this kind of participation as a bit like doing a, crowd, uh, a crossword puzzle um, or some kind of detective um, work. But these more challenge-orientated crowd contributors are usually working independently. Um, feedback and progress monitoring is important to them. Um, but usually for self-assessment reasons and to see that their contributions are making a difference um, and a difference to the project overall. Um, and I want at this point to emphasise one thing and um, really underline this. I think it's very important to note that nearly all the crowdsourced transcription projects report very high levels of accuracy despite the isolation of contributors. Um, sometimes reviewing and checking tasks uh, Helpful, they can be turned into a, a bit of a variety for your participants. They can also be adapted as a means for more experienced volunteers to develop their skills um, or for new people to gain confidence. So, uh, most transcription uh, crowdsourcing functions on the basis of at least two, usually three or more independent transcriptions of each source entry. Those may be verified algorithmically before human review, but there's often a need for a judgment call as well. Um, and one other thing while I'm on accuracy, enabling participants to assess the accuracy of their own contribution is important, important not only for quality control reasons, um, but also significantly because uh, anxiety about the quality of one's own contribution often results in people dropping out of participation altogether, which obviously risks the size of your participating crowd. Um, but it's also evidence that the entry threshold may be too high for attracting new contributors if they find it too difficult or they can't 
not judge for the contribution is good enough. So, um, by way of concluding, I noticed that I'm scheduled for the slot for lunch. So, um, I thought I'd like to end with a few kind of tips or a summary of this research in, in terms of do's and don'ts and how to attract a hungry crowd to, a, to an indexing or transcription project. Um, actually, I think these principles that I'm about to go through would hold for just about all kinds of crowdsourcing, but I hope they're particularly helpful for anyone in the room who might be approaching new pre uh, UK gen projects, um, and for people who are looking at um, crowdsourcing from the perspective of a, a more established um, core community. Um, so firstly, I, I suggest it helps to think of crowdsourcing as offering a series of meze or tackles dishes or tasks that make up a crowdsourcing meal, rather than serving up one enormous dish. Um, a variety of different tasks uh, which kind of match to a diversity of participant skills and abilities and time to contribute. So some of those tasks will need to be snacks, they'll need to be quick to complete, so that beginners aren't discouraged by attempting things which take ages to do or are just far too difficult for them. Um, but too many of those snacks and the project becomes boring and repetitive. So you have to get it. It's quite a tricky balance, I think. Um, but different levels of challenge, of course, help in, um, enhance the participant's sense of progression and they increase layers of difficulty so that people can move through the project and, and learn as they, as they go on. Um, and remember as well, I think Richard and Jen does this very well already, but uh, remember that some participants might actually like to be involved in the development of new projects or try a new responsibility, whereas there will also be a crowd of people who would just prefer to stick with something familiar that they know they could do well. Uh, secondly, the menu planning. Um, participants seem to appreciate it if they know what they're working towards, so some kind of menu. That might be a project progress board. Um, it's useful for participants to plan their own way through the project so that they know what the end goal is um, and so that they can see how what they're doing relates to the project as a whole. Along similar lines, the basic idea of crowdsourcing is that anyone can participate, uh, that they don't need previous knowledge and there shouldn't be any other admission tests or barrier. The task doesn't always have to be easy, that's not quite what I'm saying, but it must always be clear. So every project should provide instructions, uh, some kind of recipe explaining what it is you're asking the volunteer to do, with, uh, and preferably with some very clear examples. Um, this is my don't. Uh, remember that too much refined processed food is bad for you. Um, <laughs> In other words, um, try not to ask people to do things that a computer can process easily and more quickly. So thinking about does a human checker need to look at every single entry or just those where the entries disagree? Um, it's interesting to hear Graham talk about um, free probate, might optical character recognition, um, increasingly I have to say handwriting character recognition offer a first stage solution in some instances um, and then ask the crowd to do the checking that requires a human judgment call after the first pass by the machine. It becomes very um, wearing on people to ask them to do things they know a machine can do that to them. Um, in any case, there are two kind of aspects to this. Firstly, letting parties, uh, potential participants get uh, an idea of what the project involves before committing themselves too much. Um, and secondly, checking that your food tastes good before, uh, just kind of during the cooking. In other words, providing uh, a food feedback loop, allowing participants to assess the quality of their own contributions. Um, and ultimately, um, this is important too for um, ensuring accuracy and the usefulness of the project's results. And then finally, um, and this should be obvious to everybody in the room on the 20th anniversary of 3MD, don't forget to celebrate success. Um, but not just the completion of the project overall, um, everybody I think appreciates some recognition or praise of their effort.
efforts. And there are lots of ways of doing this online um, and offline, of course. Um, but Bell Handel, let me just give you some examples. Uh, Bell Handel awards virtual points for every contribution, uh, which can be saved up and then redeemed by participants for, say, a hard resolution document scan or saved up to buy a book. Um, they also award occasional gifts at milestones, so um, the point at which they reach 50% of the project, or maybe the 15,000 entry to be transcribed. Um, and I think they see that's quite important as a way to ensure beginners can be rewarded as well as the established volunteers. Um, other things that have been uh, incorporated in transcription crowdsourcing with some success include team contests, so not the competition between individuals, but a kind of team effort to get to a certain number of records transcribed or whatever it might be, some kind of scheduled challenge, uh, or it could involve some offline or maybe online, I guess, expert workshops, but uh, kind of related events of some kind or another. And that was pretty much all I had to say on crowdsourcing. I said I put the links up to various projects that I referenced. I don't think anyone's got any questions. Great, there'll be some